Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe is on assignment right now on Morning News Now. Compromise, but not a done deal yet. This morning, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are calling on Congress to pass their debt limit agreement with just days to go before risking a default. It takes uh, the threat of catastrophic default off the table, protects our hard-earned and historic economic recovery, and the agreement also represents a compromise, which means no one got everything they want. We'll bring you the latest on where things stand, including the concessions that were made, the challenges ahead, and what could happen if the deal does not make it through Congress. Also this morning, searching for survivors. Breaking overnight, rescue crews are pulling people from the rubble of a collapsed apartment building in Davenport, Iowa. Right now, several people are still unaccounted for. More on the efforts underway to find any survivors and the investigation into what happened. Holiday getaway. Tens of millions of Americans are spending this Memorial Day holiday out of town. The weekend is actually shaping up to be a record-breaking one for travel. We'll have team coverage on the conditions in the skies and on the roads. And off the menu, it's a byproduct of the pandemic that many diners say has run its course. We're talking about those QR codes that you scan on your phone to get an online menu, eliminating that traditional paper menu. Well, we will tell you about the push to end the COVID-era trend. And a happy Memorial Day to those of you at home. We appreciate you spending this holiday morning with us. And we begin with that major breakthrough in the debt ceiling standoff. President Biden announced a tentative agreement with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy to avoid defaulting on outstanding U.S. debt. Let's get into some of the details. The two struck a deal Saturday night after weeks of high-stakes negotiations, and it comes just days before the U.S. is set to run out of money. The agreement still has to go be approved by Congress before the president can actually sign it. There are are early signs it could face a tough road in the House. The president warned there is still a lot of work to be done to avoid a crisis. We've got good news. We've got a, just spoke with Speaker McCarthy, and we've reached a bipartisan budget agreement that we're ready to move to the full Congress. And I think it's a really important step forward. That agreement now goes to the United States House and to the Senate. I strongly urge both both chambers to pass that agreement. Let's keep moving forward on meeting our obligations and building the strongest economy in the history of the world. Let's bring in NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. Hi, Julie. Good morning. Thanks for spending this holiday with us. So we heard also President Biden say that nobody got everything that they wanted in this agreement. So tell us here, what are some of the biggest concessions and also wins for both Democrats and Republicans here? Yeah, good morning, Savannah. Happy Memorial Day. Look, having spent literally every minute in the Capitol this weekend, I can tell you both sides are working very hard to try and sell this as a win for their side. So let's talk about what is in this bill and what finally made it in. If you talk, and if you listen to President Biden, he'll say he stopped work requirements for Medicaid from going into effect. He stopped some of these harsher policy that Republicans were able to pass in their bill, kind of marking the starting point for their side on these negotiations. But it does raise the debt ceiling for two years, $4 trillion lift, which is why we heard some grumblings from some conservative Republicans. And it does cut $1.5 trillion in spending over the next several years. This is significant for both sides because Republicans, of course, did not want to raise the debt ceiling without those spending cuts. And Democrats kept pushing for a clean debt ceiling hike, both of which, of course, neither their side got. But what it does is it protects Medicaid, but it does expand work requirements for SNAP and food stamps, meaning if you were previously able to qualify for those food stamps up to the age of 49, now you have to have a job up to the age of 54 if you're able-bodied and if you don't have dependents to qualify for that measure. It also expands permitting reform for energy companies, making that process easier. And it claw back some COVID funds and IRS funding as well to come up with that spending cut number. Now, it does not touch the VA. Veterans Health remains intact, and it fully funds defense spending, even lifting that number for the next year. Julie, we also don't honestly have that much information at this point about how this deal was able to be reached. I mean, there was very little insight given at this point. But he did have this to say. The president said this about coming to terms with a new debt ceiling. Let's take a listen to some of that. They passed the debt ceiling, and they said they'd only do it on condition that it have all these cuts in it. I said, I'm not going to do that. You pass the debt ceiling, period. I'll negotiate with you on the cuts, what you say what's going to happen, what the budget's going to look like. 
That's what we are negotiating in order to get to them deciding that they're going to go along with a new debt ceiling. Knowing that this has been such a long road to get to this point, what else do we know about the specifics of the negotiations, about the back and forth behind closed doors? You know, here's the totally wild thing, right? Because a week ago from today, they literally had nothing done. Right. I was talking to we're working on this deal. And it really came together in the last 72 hours. One of the Republican negotiators told me yesterday that it took the president coming back from overseas, remember he cut those overseas trips short, to really seal the deal on this and be able to get some kind of agreement with Speaker McCarthy. They were working on text uh, since Saturday. They were working on it all day yesterday as well, 150 pages of it. And it really took a lot of compromise from both sides, because look, the reality is Republicans control the House. They already managed to pass their bill narrowly, but they passed it. And that really put some wind in their sails as they went to the negotiating table here. Democrats on the flip side control the Senate, obviously the White House. So Republicans did need to bend to them to come together and meet in the middle. And overall, you hear the two leaders say that this was a bipartisan negotiation. This was a compromise, not everything everyone wanted. Mm. Julie Serkin, thank you so much for your reporting here. We appreciate it. Well, a record number of Americans took to the skies and highways this Memorial Day weekend. According to AAA, more than 42 million Americans traveled more than 50 miles from home this weekend. Well, nearly 37 million people drove to their destinations. That is up 6% from last year. And while drivers faced some minor slowdowns on the nation's roadways, it was relatively smooth sailing. Meanwhile, the TSA says they expect to screen roughly 10 million passengers by the end of today. But so far, it seems it's going to be better than last year. Less than 1% of flights are getting canceled. With all the talk of travel, we sometimes forget what this holiday is actually all about. And that is, of course, remembering our nation's service members who lost their lives in the line of duty. NBC News military analyst and Medal of Honor recipient Colonel Jack Jacobs is here with how you can remain respectful and focus on that purpose while still celebrating this Memorial Day. Plus, Katie Nastro, travel expert, is going to talk to us about how to get home without too many headaches. But first, let's head to NBC News correspondent George Solis, who's been tracking the holiday travel all weekend, and he joins us now from Philadelphia International Airport. Hey, George, good morning. So how has it been this weekend? What's it like right now? How crowded is it? Hey, good morning, Savannah. Yeah, things looking fairly good here at Philadelphia International, as they have all weekend. We can probably call this the calm before the storm, right? We know that a number of people will begin to make that commute home from the holiday weekend, putting the airlines and other forms of transportation to the test. As you mentioned, airlines hoping to repeat the meltdown of last year when there were those rampant delays and cancellations as a result of those staffing and crew shortages. Airlines saying they were prepared for the rush this time. Today, the FAA expects some 42 thousand flights at some of the nation's major airports and we've been keeping a look at the misery map so far a lot of green on the map most of the delays right now appear to be in the new york airspace you might expect that to change as the afternoon progresses of course the other big part of this is the cancellation rate has remained under one percent secretary pete Buttigieg highlighting that this weekend because that is obviously very good news and a symbol of what they have been saying as far as the airline preparation. Now, I've been talking to a number of travelers here at the airport over the weekend who said this was the year they wanted to get out. This is probably the most normal they have felt being at the airport. Take a listen to some of my conversation. Get here early. Keep the stress. The earlier you get here, the less stress you have. And stress-free traveling is the best way to go. Yeah, you mentioned the number of people driving, 37 million. That's probably no surprise. Obviously, we know that gas is about a dollar cheaper, give or take, on your state than it was last year. So a lot of people decided to pack up the car and hit the road for that 50 mile or more destination. And based on some of the photos I've seen of people and families, a lot of people making good of the weather, too, which hasn't been too much of a factor, it seems. Savannah. Awesome. George, thank you. Stick with us. I want to now bring in the travel expert, Katie Nastro. Hey, Katie. So that travel, uh, that travel there, there's some good advice here. You know, we're hearing from some people at the airport. If you are flying home today, what are some tips that you say to make it a smooth one? 
Sure. I mean, on Friday alone, we saw 2.7 million people get on a flight. That's what TSA reported. So you might be thinking, oh, no, am I going to encounter a busy airport and all the stress that can sometimes go with traveling? But the best piece of advice that we can offer is, you know, if you have a connecting flight, check to see what the weather is like in your connection city. If it's looking a bit dicey, sometimes you can contact the airline and mm. actually have them reroute you. So that's something to just keep in the back of your head. As well as this is a really great great day to utilize your TSA pre-check, especially for the whole family. Kids 13 to 17 are actually allowed to go through a TSA holder, parent or guardian, this holiday weekend. So getting the whole family through should be a lot less stressful. And for those of us don't, who don't have TSA pre-check, for only $15 a year, so that's good for five years, you can get it and have a stress-free stress uh, security line experience. So that's something, again, to keep in mind. And then regardless if your flight is canceled or significantly delayed, no Know that by law, you are entitled to a full cash refund if you sh should take it or a new flight, period, end of story. So regardless of what happens, just mm. remember that you are covered. Yeah, that is a tip I think we've all become a lot more familiar with in the last couple of years as we've seen these crazy numbers of cancellations, lost luggage, big delays, that kind of stuff. George, that was something that we did actually see last Memorial Day. Are we expecting anything like that? Any mass cancellations, anything like last year? Yeah, that's the expectation. And today is obviously the test of that. We know that, again, as I mentioned, the cancellation rate has been under 1%. So we will see throughout the day, we'll be keeping a close eye on flight delays and cancellations around the country. But the airlines saying they have got it. They have got the staffing. They are hoping to avoid a repeat of what we saw last summer, Savannah. Absolutely. Katie, quickly before we go, if you're at home, maybe one of our viewers, thank you for joining us from home this morning, but this is making you kind of have a travel bug talking about all this. Are there any deals left out there? Where should we look? Sure, there are definitely deals to be had. You know, I before getting on here, uh, I found a really great deal from New York City down to Puerto Rico in mm. August, the height of summer, for $243 round mm. trip. And so a lot of us are thinking, oh, no, is it too late to find any great deals? While finding last-minute summer deals is definitely tough, just remember this. If you can be a little bit flexible, the first two weeks in June and the last two weeks in August can actually save you about 40% versus traveling in the middle of summer when everybody's off from school and everybody's looking to take advantage of the better weather. So if you can be a little bit flexible and you want to still save, look to those two weeks and kind of skirt the summer. Absolutely. Going travel expert Katie Mastro and our own George Solis, thank you so much and happy Memorial Day to you both. Now let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Michelle Grossman is joining us on this Memorial Day with your latest forecast and a sneak peek at the week ahead. Hi, Michelle. Good morning. Hi there, Savannah. So good to see you on this Memorial Day. And the good news is, weather-wise, we are pretty quiet across the country. We do have some hiccups, but for the most part, we're looking good. And as George said, travel going really well, knock on wood, as we go throughout this Memorial Day, at least weather-wise. So taking a look at radar, we do have some green showing up on radar. That's showing us where the rain is, and we will have rain in spots today. Uh, but the major cities looking fairly good. Let's focus on this coastal low. We've been talking about it all weekend long. We are talking about it at the end of last week as well. It's an area of low pressure that's sort of spinning off the Carolina coast. It's bringing some rain. It was a dreary weekend there. It's going to be dreary again today. And those showers could reach portions of the mid-Atlantic too. So even as far north as D.C. into the Delmarva, we could see some showers. Even Philly could see some showers as well. We're not talking a washout in those spots, but still could see a shower. So this is what it looks like today for your holiday outlook. The cool and wet in the Carolinas to the mid-Atlantic. Heavy rain is possible. It's likely really in portions of southern Texas. We could see some scattered storms even from the northern plains, the central plains, southern plains, spotty showers throughout portions of the Intermountain West and also northern California. But New York City, 78 degrees, lots of sunshine, really beautiful there. Jacksonville, 88, um, partly sunny skies. Phoenix, you're going to be really warm, but you're used to that, 100 degrees with lots of sunshine. And we're looking at 92 in Vegas. Travel-wise, this is what I was talking about. Weather-wise, we're looking pretty good. We could see some moderate impacts in Philly, D.C., Charlotte, Dallas, and Houston, but we're not expecting major delays. And really, Los Angeles looks good. San Francisco, Salt Lake City, Minneapolis, Miami, and Orlando looking in the green. But we are watching that mid-Atlantic soaker. We're going to be watching that today. Here's the good news. We're finally going to see it pull off the coast tomorrow. But today, still persistent rain, gusty winds, some cool temperatures. We saw temperatures even 25 degrees below what is typical for this time of year. So that's not ideal for the unofficial start to summer. And then tomorrow, we're finally going to see this low shifting off the coast over the Atlantic. And we're going to find only see those rain and clouds disappearing. But 
For now, we're looking at the chance for some rain today. You can see pockets of some heavier downpours. That's where you're seeing the yellow there. So if you're in these spots, you need to prepare for that. But overall, you're going to see that move off tomorrow. And then we're also looking at the chance for some storms in the southern plains. Savannah? Awesome. Michelle, hey, lots of good news there. We will take it. Yeah. Thank you so much and enjoy yeah. your Memorial Day. Yeah. Well, many of us will be outside enjoying that great weather or maybe coming home from vacation. Memorial Day is really about a time to honor and remember those service members who died in the line of duty. NBC News military analyst and Medal of Honor recipient Colonel Jack Jacobs joins us now on this. Good morning, Colonel. It is always so wonderful to have you with us, especially on this Memorial Day. Um, first, I'm just wondering if you could help us put this day in context. Tell us why Memorial Day is important to you as one of our heroes, what you want people at home to think about today. Well, I would never give, <clears throat> I would never say it's not a good idea to get together with friends and family and uh, take a day off and enjoy each other and the blessings of liberty. But we have to remember that all this liberty came at, a, at enormous cost. This used to be called Decoration Day. We would go out to cemeteries and place flags mm -hmm. and flowers on the graves of the fallen. I grew up in the shadow of the Second World War where my father fought. And uh, we have to remember we lost almost half a million mm -hmm. Americans killed during the Second World War. We've lost many more since then uh, in the wars we fought to preserve America's interests, the interests of our allies and our freedom. And it will really be a worthwhile exercise to remember that people gave their lives uh, so that we could enjoy a day like today. Uh, those who forget that, uh, to paraphrase uh, Abraham Lincoln, are uh, making a very, very big mistake. Those of us who actually fought in combat do remember this, not just on Memorial Day, but uh, almost every other day since then, uh, since we fought, Savannah. Mm. Such a powerful reminder and such an important conversation to be having. Colonel, what are some ways that people can honor those who gave the ultimate sacrifice protecting our country? Well, we uh, live in an environment in which we've decided to outsource the defense of the country to a very small number of young men and women who are willing to do that. And so the defense of the country seems to be very, very far away. It's not something in which we're involved. But it really would be worthwhile from time to time for people to think about all those young people out there right now, all over the world, who are defending us and keeping us free. Uh, but there are other ways that uh, people can, can do good works. Uh, we have lots and lots of veterans out there. there are, there's a large number of veterans organizations that take care of veterans and their families. We have to remember that families serve as well while the uh, service member is deployed, many of which are, many of whom are deployed right now. I, uh, a quick plug, I happen to be a board member of Children of Fallen Patriots Foundation, which mm -hmm. raises money to send to college. Kids who've lost a parent killed in action. There are lots of worthwhile veterans organizations out there and getting involved with them or in local organizations that take care of veterans is vitally important for our community and for the veterans themselves, Savannah. And Colonel, for those families of fallen service members, maybe it's some of our viewers, maybe it's our viewers' neighbors, what kind of support do they need? Well, they often need a great deal of emotional support, sometimes financial support. Don't forget the, the fallen service member is frequently the only breadwinner, uh, and families are left, frequently families with children are left with no, no, no one to assist them. But I think... Uh, the thing that holds military units together, the sense, the sense of family, the sense of comradeship, the, the perception that we're all in it together, mm. that should extend to communities too. And it would be worthwhile for people in communities to seek out uh, veteran members and their families so that they can assist them. I'm always reminded of the observation of Benjamin Franklin, who just before the Revolutionary War started, uh, wrote, we must hang together or we will surely hang separately. Mm. Well, that's true in military families and military organizations, but it would be useful if people who are mm. in communities where there are military members, the veterans and their families, to think of that as well, Savannah. 
Absolutely. Colonel Jacobs, I'm so happy we had this conversation this morning. Thank you for joining us on Memorial Day. Thank you for helping us remember. I love what you said. It would be worthwhile to think about how we have these blessings of liberty. So powerful. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. You're Thank welcome. you. And your father, you're coming from a family of service members. Thank you for your service, Colonel. It's always good to have you. Well, while many families this weekend will enjoy that extra day off, time by the pool or the barbecue, others are paying tribute, as we were just discussing, to the men and women in our armed forces who have made the ultimate sacrifice. NBC's Lindsay Reiser revisits one Wisconsin family whose three daughters went to war with one never coming home. It started as a testament of American patriotism and duty. Tonight we have a story of a thoroughly modern military family that has a lot of people thinking way back to saving Private Ryan. Three sisters, twins Charity and Michelle and older sister Rachel, going to war in Iraq with the Wisconsin National Guard. I have a twin sister. It's going to be really hard. But less than a year into her deployment, 20-year-old Michelle was killed when her Humvee was ambushed. Sisters Charity and Rachel flew home. Michelle's casket followed. Michelle's 2004 death making international headlines, raising fresh questions about what to do when siblings go to war. She had seen the worst of Iraq, and yet she kept her faith in God and in humanity. This is a really good picture, too. Today, Michelle's parents, John and Lori Whitmer, still live in Wisconsin. Just like before we lost Michelle or after. There's, um, it was such a change. Everything just changed. And it never goes back. These days, they find joy in their 10 grandchildren. John is writing a second book after sharing Michelle's story in hopes of helping other families cope with grief. Why was it important for you to be so black and white about the darkest moments of your family's life? Because other people are going through the same thing. Because then they may know that they're not alone. It's been 20 years since the start of the Iraq War and 19 since Michelle's passing. But her memory and name live on, like in the street sign near her childhood home and in her niece's name. I just feel that it was the name I was being meant to give. Like, I'm so happy to be named after her. I wonder what she would have been like and if she would have had kids of her own. And... Well, sound okay with you guys? Michelle's twin charity, who retired from the military after serving eight years, now lives in Texas and has three girls of her own, including oldest Madison Michelle, all preparing this Memorial Day weekend to honor Michelle's memory. There's just a solemnity. When you lose somebody you loved so much and they have this day to honor all of the soldiers who have lost their lives, you just look at it in such a new way. I just try to live as the best person that I can be and just remember that she's probably looking down on me. So I'm trying to make her proud. You want to put it up? The Whitmer family says while time has sanded the sharp edges of grief, there's not a day that goes by that they don't think of Michelle. She will be gone 20 years next April, and that's as old as she was. You never want to believe that your children will be forgotten. And she's not forgotten. She's not forgotten. An impossibly high price for any family to have to pay for a grateful nation, a time to remember. Lindsay Reiser, NBC News, New Berlin, Wisconsin. What a great story there. It's so important that we've taken this time this morning to discuss the real meaning of this day. Thank you, Lindsay, for that. Well, coming up on Morning News Now, Hollywood on hold as the writer's strike approaches the one-month mark. There are new concerns that those picket lines are about to get even longer. Later this hour, why some industry insiders say you could soon be seeing a lot more reruns. But first, search and rescue breaking overnight. Several people pulled out of a collapsed apartment building in Iowa. Now the search is on for people still unaccounted for. We will take you to the scene after the break. The race to find survivors is underway in Davenport, Iowa this morning after a six-story apartment building partially collapsed Sunday afternoon. City officials say the building remains unstable as they carry out a search and rescue mission. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster joins us now from Davenport, Iowa with the latest on this. Hey, Shaq, good morning. 
Good morning, Savannah. And you see rescue workers are still actively working in the scene behind me. They were working through the night, and we saw just in the past couple of moments a dog working with one of the rescue crews. They were looking for an unknown number of unaccounted for residents here. Officials have not confirmed if there are any casualties, but when you see the devastation behind me, the fears this morning are only growing. The frickin' building just collapsed. This morning, a desperate search for survivors in Davenport, Iowa, after a devastating partial collapse of an apartment building Sunday. Unknown how many are injured or any entrapments. Officials say crews were dispatched to the scene of a six-story apartment complex on Sunday evening. The portion of the rear building had actually collapsed, uh, separated from the building. Fire crews initially rescuing seven people, later escorting a dozen more residents out of the rubble who were able to walk on their own away from the building. The cause of the collapse is under investigation. Crews also found a large natural gas leak and water leaking from all floors of the structure. Some residents saying they smelled a strong gas smell in the building. So the tenants of this building are pretty active. They've called the city numerous times with complaints. Local officials acknowledging residents have been filing complaints about the building for years. City officials say the owner of the building did have permits in place for repairs. This incident comes nearly two years after the tragic partial collapse of the Champlain Towers South Condo building that claimed the lives of 98 residents in Surfside, Florida. And just over a month after another shocking collapse of a parking garage in New York City. This morning as rescue teams continue to comb through the rubble for survivors, officials say one of the biggest obstacles is the stability of the structure. We're not actually sure how stable the building is. We want to make sure that all of our responders are able to process through in a safe manner, but we still want to get through there as quickly as possible. And as recent as this week, residents were reported complaining about bricks falling from the structure behind me. It's one of many complaints that have been filed and connected with the building that you see uh, behind me. It's a historic building here in Davenport. That, of course, will be the focus of the investigation mm -hmm. to come. But if you listen to officials, the focus right now is on that search and rescue. Oh, guys. Absolutely. All right, Jack Burster, we know you'll keep us updated on this tragedy. Thank you so much. Well, this morning, Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan is celebrating a re-election victory, winning a third term in office that was a hotly contested race. He faced the leader of the Republican People's Party in a runoff election after neither party was able to get more than 50 percent of the vote earlier this month. Well, yesterday, Erdogan was officially declared the winner of the runoff. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now from Ankara, Turkey. Matt, good to see you. So this was a very close race, intensely watched. Walk us through the significance of this win for the president, for his supporters. And I know you've been reporting on this for a while. What have you heard from voters in the lead up to the election? Yeah, you know, you mentioned that this is a close race, and we should clarify that because it was a close race in one sense. He won by 4%, which is actually along those same margins that he won back in 2018. And the reason why we call this the biggest, most formidable challenge that Erdogan has faced to his power in the 20 years that he's been running this country is because this is the first time that an election for president in Turkish history has gone to a runoff. And so that's why this was so close. He actually was much closer back two weeks ago during the initial first round, and that's why it really looked like he was on the ropes for the first time in a generation. So, you know, this was something, when we heard the news last night, we started hearing fireworks here in Ankara, we started hearing people driving around, honking their horns in celebration, but for nearly half of the electorate, this is going to be a crushing defeat, uh, and one, you know, they were had their hopes up that this was finally uh, a challenge that would take down Erdogan, who really has wrapped himself around all of the levers of power in this country, including so much of the media I spoke with some of those voters, and here's what they told me. He's already over 20 years. He, he is a proven candidate. And my friends think that they are not going to do well in Turkey, and they are looking forward to go abroad to Europe. And that's the thing that we kept hearing from a lot of Erdogan's opponents. What they see as the most salient issue in this vote is the economy. And for a lot of young people who were voting for uh, Erdogan's opponent, Kilic Tarolu, they want to see Erdogan gone. And they say, some of them told me, they'd be leaving the country if Erdogan wins. Matt, quickly, let's talk about the global implications here. Turkey, a NATO member, also though close ties to Russia. Walk us through how this might impact the U.S. and Turkey relations. 
Yeah, well, this is going to give Erdogan another five years to butt up against American foreign policy, both in Europe and in the Middle East, which he's been doing to great effect, kind of acting as a spoiler both for Washington and Brussels, uh, for NATO, especially when it comes to Russia. But you know, at the same time, even though Erdogan, who is, as you mentioned, a NATO ally, uh, is also cozied up to Vladimir Putin and bucked the prevailing trends in Europe mm. who, the, for punishing Putin, he has been useful in that sense because he has been able to be something of an inter intermediary between the West and Moscow. So now he's going to continue that, but this will still be very frustrating to a lot of Western capitals. Absolutely. All right. Matt Bradley, thank you very much. Let's stay on international news now, starting with a new wave of drone attacks in Ukraine's capital city. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Labanga joins us now for more on this and some other international headlines. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Well, this was the uh, second overnight attack on Kyiv in a row and the 15th air attack on the capital of Ukraine is in the space of a month and this damage is severe. Now, the first of the two attacks over the weekend was the largest ever drone barrage launched on Kyiv just before the celebration of the capital's founding. New details are still emerging about the full scale impact of the most recent hit. To the UK now, where newly released FBI documents have revealed a 1980s plot to assassinate the Queen of England during a trip to San Francisco with her husband, Prince Philip. According to the documents, the man behind the alleged plot was seeking revenge after his daughter was killed by a rubber, a rubber bullet in Northern Ireland. Luckily, the visit went ahead as planned. And we end our short tour of the world here in Italy, where Venice's famed Grand Canal is looking a little, well, green. Witnesses say that a fluorescent color started off in one spot along the canal and slowly started to spread. You can see gondolas and water taxis rowing along the bright green surface. Authorities are still investigating the origin of these mysterious green visitors. But for now, I guess it adds a little more color to a trip along the water. Salana. Wow, those are some wild looking images. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Well, coming up. Turmoil in Texas as state lawmakers impeach one of their own. The allegations against the state's attorney general that led to his removal, plus providing emergency care outside of the ER. How one first responder is helping one major city cut back on an overwhelming amount of 911 calls. This is Morning News Now. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, over the weekend, there was a major shakeup in Texas politics where the Republican-led House impeached one of its own, State Attorney General Ken Paxton. The ousting comes after allegations of years of misconduct. Paxton is currently suspended from office. Here's senior Washington correspondent and News Now anchor Hallie Jackson with those details. You've got Ken Paxton pushing back on the accusations against him and thanking people for what he describes as an outpouring of support after that extraordinary rebuke against him. Of course, a top Republican official in Texas, a very red state. Now there's a political fight on Paxton's hands that's far from over. A significant showdown this morning in Deep Red, Texas, a Republican-led effort against a prominent conservative and key ally of Donald Trump. There have been 121 hours and 23 days. The state attorney general, Ken Paxton, impeached and now suspended by the Texas State House over allegations of bribery, unfitness for office, and abuse of public trust. He's being attacked by his own employees. Some conservative supporters defending Paxton, including former President Donald Trump, a key ally in Texas. He's done more for the American people than any president in our lifetime. Mr. Trump also calling out Texas's Republican Governor Greg Abbott, who so far has been silent on the decision. Paxton tweeting Sunday night he's been overwhelmed by the outpouring of support after calling the historic vote a politically motivated sham. The fact that I was prohibited from presenting evidence to defend myself reveals that this shameful process was curated from the start. The three-term attorney general, no stranger to controversy, separately indicted eight years ago on securities fraud charges, pleading not guilty in a case that has yet to go to trial. But a Texas House committee led by fellow Republicans in March began investigating years-long accusations Paxton misused his office, which he denies. And this week, lawmakers filed 20 articles of impeachment against him. The evidence is substantial. 
Among the allegations, that he took bribes from a real estate investor and political donor who helped remodel his house, that he used his influence to help look into a federal investigation of that donor, and that he fired staff members who reported his misconduct. Paxton later settling for more than $3 million with four of those former aides, then asking for state money to pay that settlement. Despite the public scandals, Paxton stayed popular enough to win re-election for a third term in November. He was endorsed by Mr. Trump, but it's the state Senate that could determine his future as attorney general with a trial in the days to come and a new political fight now just beginning. For Paxton to ultimately be removed from office, a two-thirds majority of the Texas state Senate would have to vote for that. But any timing on a trial is still TBD. And the spotlight is on one senator and future juror in particular. Paxton's wife, State Senator Angela Paxton, with questions now about whether she'll recuse herself or be involved in a vote. Mm. Back to you. Hallie Jackson, thank you so much. Well, turning now to a story about a true hero, an EMT who is single-handedly reducing the number of 911 calls in one Indianapolis community. NBC News correspondent Zinkle Esamwa has her story. Are you are you able to set up at all that I It's around 9:30 a.m. in Indianapolis. What's her name? EMT Alicia Dinkeldine Warren is mid-conversation when she's pulled to administer aid. Do you know what today is? Alicia works full-time at the Wheeler Mission Homeless Center for Men as an embedded emergency medical technician or EMT. Her work is needed as there's a nationwide shortage of emergency medical services, including EMTs and paramedics. You all right? We've seen in the state of Indiana over the last five years more paramedics leaving the field than are entering the field. It's a national trend, a federal study projecting a need for 40,000 more full-time emergency medical personnel from 2016 to 2030. To become a certified EMT, individuals must pass a national certification exam, including a fitness test. Paramedics require additional education and training. To address the need, some communities are incentivizing prospects, offering thousands in scholarships for paramedic training. Alicia hopes her work at the shelter gives EMS workers in her community more bandwidth. And what that does is, is decreases the number of trucks that are running to that area um, and makes them more available for other 911 calls. By embracing community paramedicine, Alicia is providing comprehensive emergency care outside the hospital setting. I'm officially here now. Assisting with scheduling doctor's appointments, picking up prescriptions, applying for social services and more. So I'm getting your medicine. According to Indianapolis EMS, the shelter's 911 call volume, one of the highest in the city, drops 48% during the hours Alicia is in the building. For individuals like Charles Powell, it's been life-changing. Three years ago, Charles suddenly became blind and lost his job and home. It was scary. Uh I mean, real scary, not being able to see. At the shelter, he met Alicia, who connected him with an eye surgeon. I said I had cataracts. They said it's the thickest cataracts they ever seen. But today, thanks to that medical care, Charles can see again and largely credits Alicia. The EMT hoping amid this shortage, more frontline workers will return and work even closer with their communities. Zinclair Samoa, NBC News. Amazing stories. And Clay, thank you. Well, coming up, get ready for more reruns. That is the warning from Hollywood insiders nearly a month into the writer's strike. More on the new concerns this morning that the picket lines could soon get longer. And is it time to 86 that QR code? Well, why some restaurant lovers say the pandemic era trend has got to go. Next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Let's get to those new updates on the ongoing writer's strike. Well, despite the blockbuster success that comes with Memorial Day weekend releases, Hollywood is preparing for major delays on some of its most anticipated projects. NBC News contributing correspondent Kaylee Hartung has the details. Hey there. We all know Memorial Day weekend is a major money-making holiday for Hollywood, but with the writers still on strike, audiences may want to savor the content available before the well of new movies and shows runs dry. This week, summer is in full swing for Hollywood. Hey, Ben, check it out. I could die. Woo! With big movie releases making a splash. And on the small screen, all eyes on major finales after Succession Saga ended last night. Okay, buckle up. Just as Ted Lasso may end its unbelievable run. That's it for today. Now we scrim it. Barry and the marvelous Mrs. Maisel will take their final bow. Thank you and good night. And as audiences say goodbye, 
Insiders warn there may not be many scripted shows in Hollywood's line of succession. I'm a little bit tense, just a little bit. As the writer's strike now approaches its fourth week, industry experts say negotiations between the studios and the Writers Guild are at a standstill and that they expect the strike to last through the summer, meaning a looming entertainment drought may be on the horizon. If there's no shows produced during the summer, then they won't have shows to air in the fall. For almost a month, not a single word has been written for new TV and movie scripts, forcing many studios to pause production, which will likely delay the return of hit shows, like your favorite family comedies. Oh, hello. Daring dramas. The work is mysterious and important. And police procedurals. I think you and I work in the same case from opposite ends. Okay, partner. Despite the work stoppage, the summer movie season will likely be able to stay on its feet. Did you bring your rollerblades? I literally go nowhere without them. Though Hollywood is weary of another speed bump ahead, both the directors and screen actors unions will soon reach the end of their contracts with the studios at the end of June, meaning more creators may hit the picket line if new deals aren't reached. And if that's the case, then this town really will shut down even more than it already has shut down. But there is still hope Hollywood will have enough time to sling back into action. And industry insiders say expect to see a lot more reruns and unscripted shows take the place of those delayed series. That means we will likely see more competition shows and reality TV come fall. On the film side, though, that schedule is always in flux. So while there will be delays on some movies, we might not notice until a bit later. Oof. All right, Kaylee Hartung, thank you. Well, QR code menus seem to be one of the lingering byproducts of the pandemic. If you've gone out to eat at a restaurant in the last three years, you've likely struggled to get your phone to focus on that little code before you're able to order. Well, now some people and also some restaurants say they are over it. Too much of a hassle and a headache, and there's nothing like that old-fashioned paper menu. Well, Kristen Holly, founder of restaurant technology site Expedite.News, joins us now to unpack this all. Kristen, good morning. It's so funny that this has become such a talker that we, you know, it does seem like they are pretty much universally disliked. Why do you think that is? And do you think that they've overstayed their welcome? I think that uh, a lot of diners think that they've overstayed their welcome because they are a relic of very uh, unhappy pandemic times. I think that people really do treasure that hospitable restaurant experience of getting a paper menu in their hand and sitting down and don't want to be pulling out their phone when they're dining with friends and family. Yeah, I think that's part of it, right? It's like it's kind of a no-no to have your phone out at the table, but then this requires mm -hmm. it. Actually, in, there was a recent New York Times article about this and one of the bar owners, and it said the QR code is the antithesis to romance, which made me laugh. But is that, mm -hmm. do you think part of it, just kind of bringing tech to the table and the fact that this makes that something that you have to do? I think so. I think it's the forced, I think it's the forced technology. And I also think that it's, um, it just, it kills conversation. It really does when you take your phone out. Uh, so I think that people are just really wanting to get back to the before times, really wanting to get yeah. back to, I can touch a menu, I can feel it, I can mm. hold it in my hand, and I don't have to deal with my phone and tech. Where is it that customers do actually like this? Like at a coffee shop or, you know, like a parking structure, mm -hmm. have them now, that type of thing. Where does this actually work and where might it stick around? Yeah, I think if you think about uh, maybe like a beer garden or a kind of restaurant that you're lingering at for a long time and you maybe want to order a second drink or a third drink, um, you're not placing your entire order at one time. I spoke to a restaurant owner where I live in San Francisco who has a Mexican restaurant and they leave QR codes on the table for people to order throughout the meal after they've placed their first order with a server. So, you know, you decide you want a second margarita, you want to get fast scan the code, put your order in, it comes to you. That's a great use case. And I would expect that to continue for more of the casual service restaurants. Yeah, and you're actually bringing up another interesting point. It's not even just the QR codes for a menu to read what's on there. There's also these full systems to actually just order through them online without even speaking to a waiter, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's a lot of them and they are very popular, again, in the casual service situations uh, or places where um, you may want to add to your order later on. And people seem to dislike those a little bit less because they're extremely convenient right. uh, and you're not necessarily dealing with uh, like a clunky piece of technology. Yeah. <laughs> Kristen Holly, thank you very much for joining us on this talker. Thanks for getting up early for us. No problem. Thanks for having <laughs> me.
Coming up, it's the achievement of a lifetime. Today marks 70 years since the first climbers summited Mount Everest. Now hear from one young woman about her incredible experience. Stick with us. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. Well, the new Little Mermaid movie proving things might be better under the sea. Get this. Disney's live action remake made a big splash dominating the box office this weekend. It's expected to pull in nearly $120 million. Halle Bailey is being praised for her performance as Ariel. It follows harsh criticism and racist social media attacks she's faced ever since she was cast in the role. Well, the underwater adventure was the fifth biggest Memorial Day weekend opening of all time in North America. I cannot wait to see it. The animated was my favorite Disney movie, so I can't wait for this. Well, today marks 70 years since the first climbers summited Mount Everest. At the time, it seemed an impossible feat, but now, decades later, thousands have made it to the top. And for one young woman, it was the culmination of a lifelong dream. Our own Joe Fryer got to talk to her about it. Hey there, good morning. A 29-year-old from Boston has given new meaning to the term you only live once after she quit her job to accomplish her dream of climbing Mount Everest. A week ago, Rebecca Long reached the top of the world after completing the months-long trek up Mount Everest. Long was one of only two people out of a group of five who managed to reach the top of the world's highest mountain. She joins us now. Rebecca, so good to have you with us. Congratulations. Talk to you to us about your experience. What made you want to leave your job to do this and how it feels now that you have done it? Well, thanks so much, Joe. It's an absolute pleasure to be on here today. I never thought that this would reach so many people and I'd make it on the news like this, but it's super exciting. Um, but um, so I don't know, I'd been taking some time off um, with my work to go mountain climbing to various places from Aconcagua and Argentina to Ecuador, a um, bunch of volcanoes down there, um, totally stretching the limits of my PTO. So um, once Everest um, came onto my, uh, you know, into my realm, like I knew it was a possibility. Um, I tried to ask permission from my employer because I love my job so much. Um, so I tried to convince them that I could bring them publicity, that this would make me a better worker and, you know, that I would take unpaid leave. But ultimately they couldn't make the exception. <laughs> so the only logical next step for me was just putting in my notice and you know, going for it because, I mean, you only do live once. So an opportunity like this only comes up, you know, um, you just have to take it when it does. So I, I love um, that climbing yeah, Mount Everest was uh, was uh, your idea of uh, I would make me a better worker. That is awesome. What did it feel like when you when you got <laughs> to the top of that mountain? Oh, it was just um, it was just ecstasy. Like once I finally made it because it was months of actually more like years culminating of effort and struggle just trying to get up there and just um all the ways that i imagined it would be like to be up there just nothing held the candle to what it was actually like it was just incredibly difficult and like all the struggle that i went through just made it even more sweeter just being at the top we are reminded, of course, that this is very dangerous, what you did. Um, you lost a friend, someone who was with you during this journey, and we're so sorry to hear about that. I mean, talk about that part of the experience and, and what it was like for you to continue pushing through after losing someone. Sure. Well, already um, death um, on Everest and other big mountains like that is kind of omnipresent like death is a constant risk that you're dealing with when you sign up for a trip like this um and so losing someone on the mountain is just heartbreaking um but then especially losing someone on your team especially a team like that small where there's only five people starting out with that was particularly gutting for us um and i really did like um Jonathan, our teammate who passed away very much. He was like a very wise and kind person, a doctor, um, and did a lot in his field to help others. Um, so losing him was not only shocking and scary, but it also just changed the dynamic of the team a bit more. And just losing that important member was just something that was really hard to work through. But on the bright side, it, I guess it gave me a more profound reason to summit. It wasn't just, you know, my own 
selfish trying to get to the top anymore. It was this is life or death. And he is in my heart now trying to get to the top. We're all thinking of him and and his family. Rebecca, as for you, what's next? I've received like a surprising amount of positive reactions to my blog and my writing. So it seems like finally like I, something that I could actually pursue maybe professionally. But who knows, really the future is a big question mark right now and that's exciting to me. <laughs> You've certainly got quite the story to tell. Rebecca Long, congratulations once again. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. <sighs> Yes, Rebecca, Joe, thank you both. Wow, what an incredible conversation. How inspiring. Well, that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. Happy Memorial Day. Thank you to our service members, our heroes, our veterans. We appreciate your service. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.